My name's Ed Stafford, I'm an explorer, and this is my above and beyond story. Everyone told me I was going to die. When I announced at the beginning of 2008 that I was going to attempt to become the first person to walk the length of the Amazon, nobody thought it was possible. I, um, I didn't have any money to get an expedition like this off the ground, and so I applied to Sir Ranulph Fines, who had an expedition trust, to um, get a grant off him. They consulted an Amazon expert, and the Amazon expert can, reported back to the trustees that um, to walk the length of the Amazon was impossible. Um, luckily for me, Ran has this lovely tradition of supporting mad but marvellous expeditions, so they thought, OK, well, this guy qualifies, he's mad, and if he comes back alive, that would be marvellous. So he gave me some money, um, which was nice. The plan was really, really simple. I was going to leave the Pacific coast of Peru, which is here. I was going to walk up and over the Andes Mountains, find the furthest source of um, the Amazon, which is um, on a mountain called Nevado Mismi, follow the river all the way through Peru, through the tiny little southern tip of Colombia then, and then right across the map to uh, the Atlantic Ocean, right the way through Brazil. Logistically, that was pretty easy to do. I just had to keep the river on the left-hand side, keep walking downhill, and uh, two and a half years later, I'd be um, at the mouth of the Amazon. I wanted it to take a year. It was a si kind of sizable chunk of my life that I was prepared to give up for a daft jaunt like this. And so I divided the length of the river, which is about 4,000 miles, by 365 days, because um, that's, that's how many there are in a year. And I came up with 11 miles a day. And I thought, I could walk 11 miles a day. That sounds quite feasible. Um, actually, with machete in hand, chopping an opening through the jungle, um, I actually averaged four miles a day. So the expedition took two years and four months, 860 days to complete. I started it with a mate of mine who uh, was called Luke Collier. Um, we were both based in London. We had every opportunity to go to the Royal Geographical Society, the home of British exploration, to get the official coordinates for the official furthest source of the Amazon. But we didn't. We went to Wikipedia instead, and probably not surprisingly, the coordinates were completely wrong. The little stream of water didn't even flow into the Amazon basin. So we kind of used the force. We kind of knew roughly um, what it looked like from a uh, bit of research on the internet and photos and stuff. And we eventually found this very infamous white cross, which is, was a, a white wooden cross on the side of this mountain. And there was, there was a little a rock above it and streams of water trickling out of it. And we thought, this is lovely. This is a very romantic notion of the furthest source of the Amazon. So we took some photos got out the Union Jack and um, then annoyingly we found another cross which was an iron cross that was put there by National Geographic and then we found another plaque that was put there by another expedition we thought this is rubbish there can't be multiple sources of the Amazon all on different points on the same side of this mountain so we thought the only real way to cover all bases because there were glaciers above us and therefore subglacial streams was to summit the mountain upon which all of these supposed furthest sources of the Amazon sprung so we did that got up early in the next morning the summit was about 5,000 600 meters of Nevado Mismi, so starting to get into altitude sickness territory. Um, so we were kicking steps into snow and stuff like that. Got to the top, and I, the utter relief of three weeks of walking that was the longest walk I'd ever done in my life up to that point. Three weeks of walking from the coast of Peru, but we were, we were at the start point, and definitely everything was downhill from um, now on, including unfortunately my relationship with Luke after. Um, Three months of the expedition, he'd said, I've completely had enough of you, I'm going home, which he did. At this point, um, the expedition started to get quite a lot more dangerous. Um, we were going through the red zone, which, for those of you who don't know, is the sort of lawless drugs trafficking area of um, of Peru. Uh, the area also spills into a area of very, very cut off indigenous tribes. We haven't seen any sign of life, human life, whether it be a path or a a machete cut in a in a branch for getting on for two weeks now. This is the most remote we've been so far can by by miles. If we if we have a an emergency now, if we can't deal with it ourselves, we're dead. Full stop. I just thought, do you know what? The risks are quite high now and I'm gonna try and mitigate that by making a little rule to myself and my rule was that I wouldn't walk on my own I would always try and walk with somebody else sometimes that would be a couple of um, local guys who would decide to walk with me for a day sometimes they'd just walk for a half an hour and get bored and decide to go back to their village so I went down river to this little um, indigenous community walked around the village um, 
quite intimidated, quite scared. It was um, the bottom of the river Ene, which is right bang in the center of all the, the troubled areas um, in the jungle in Peru. And um, every single adult male, again, in this village said, no, I'm not prepared to walk with you. And then this little boy who'd actually been on the boat, um, which I came in on, with him, had a massive grin on his face. He was only about that high. And he just said, with a massive grin, he just said, I'll walk with you. And I said, brilliant, I think. Um, how old are you? And he said, 16. Um, what's your name? He said Elias and so Elias and I um, um, became walking partners and I brought him a pair of plimsolls and a pair of shorts <coughs> and he came on the boat back with me. He was about to join the army and for him this was a massive adventure. And we walked for about six days together. Eventually we came to a little community uh, called Pamakiari and a woman ran out screaming and threw a bucket of water over me and then this big crowd of predominantly women stood in front of me and um, they blocked the way and then I caught the eye of a, a taller lady at the back who was wearing the same indigenous face paint and the same uh, beads and she uh, moved moved slightly forward to the um, crowd and held out her hand and uh, said uh, are you English my name's Emily and uh, in a really posh English accent and I was just like oh my goodness thank you thank you Emily turned out to be an Italian anthropologist and she said have you got any idea where you are have you got any idea um, what these people have been through and I have to admit I hadn't I'd spent my entire time either planning the route or trying to get funding for the expedition and I hadn't done any research into the indigenous tribes as I started communicating with Emily they did indeed calm down and you know that she had spent six months working with the indigenous um, overseeing community in a nearby town to be allowed to come and to come and uh, study these uh, um, indigenous um, tribal people. Elias had to go home. Elias was a little bit young um, and he was, as I said, joining the military. And Emily actually introduced me to a guy called Cho. This is, this is Cho here. Cho and I, I think it's fair to say, didn't get on very well at first. But what I couldn't um, fail to notice was that Cho was extraordinarily confident and he wasn't intimidated and completely opposite to me, who was a paranoid, nail-biting mess at this point of the expedition. Cho had confidence. He knew the dodgy areas and he knew the dangerous areas and he knew the safe areas as well, which was extraordinarily helpful for me. So um, I started walking with Cho and he said he'd walk for five days. And then after that five days, he said, Do you know, Ed, I'm, I'm still quite enjoying this, if you want. Um, and uh, I'll walk with you all the way to the mouth of the Amazon. And um, that's what happened. He literally never went home. Um, for the next two years of his life, um, he walked with me all the way through um, Peru, Colombia, and then right the way to the mouth of the Amazon. And um, actually, towards the end of the expedition, he wanted to um, he wanted to expand his English. And so we talked about coming over to England. So eventually we did. In fact, after the expedition was finished, if we fast forward a little bit, um, he came over to England. He uh, lived with my mum up in Leicestershire and he played for my local rugby club. And then at the end of season dinner, he got awarded overseas player of the year, which was uh, quite, <laughs> quite a nice thing. Um, so Joe and I were the new walking team and we walked all the way through um, Peru. We walked through first Amazonian flood season um, and uh, you know I don't think anyone um, even if you go back to Percy Fawcett the um, old British explorer they would only go into the Amazon jungle during the dry season the the wet season was off limits and that Joe and I didn't want to hang around in a jungle town for months and months on end it was far too expensive we didn't have enough funds to be able to do that so we just had to walk straight through the flood season and the Amazon river when it floods it's not like there's a a canal towpath down the side of it. It floods up to 80 kilometers either side of the main channel of the river. This is why everyone thinks it's impossible. This is why no one can walk the Amazon because they think it's all underwater and therefore you can't walk. But if I now know the extent of the, the river at peak flood season, I can annotate my map and I can plot a route on high ground. The mapping situation on this whole expedition was ridiculous. For a large part of it, in Peru, I was using these um, navigational charts down here, but there's the so li little detail on it. This map here I was using for quite a substantial period and that's a one to four million map of the top half of, um, of uh, South America. You can see you've got Suriname, Guyana, Venezuela on that, Colombia. And I was using that to, um, to navigate using a map and compass when the GPS stopped working, uh, which was quite farcical. But at the end of the day, I was just going east. And I knew that if I woke up in the morning and during the morning I follow, uh, headed towards the sun and in the afternoon I just followed my shadow that, that I'd loosely be okay. And it, and it turned out to be the case. You, you were walking around in circles if you used too detailed information and we just had to, as much as possible, employ local guides who knew the way to the next village. That was by far the most efficient way of getting from one village to another. The hunting trails. Um, and obviously a lot of the time they would go by river, but we were like, no, 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 we don't, obviously can't go by river. We just want to use the hunting trails to get to the next village. And at the beginning of 2009, we entered Brazil. And um, if you cast your mind back to that time, 
the financial situation in the world was collapsing and um, I just thought rather smugly to myself what a brilliant time to be walking the Amazon and I got an email from a main sponsor saying I'm really sorry Ed but we can't continue to fund your expedition we're just running out of um, our own money clients are withholding money it was extraordinary how um, so many times during this expedition we had luck on our side and things just fell into place and we didn't get killed and we did manage to get through we were supplementing our um, our meals at this time by fishing and piranha was the easiest thing to catch catch one piranha chop it up into bits put it on the end of your your hook and and you can catch lots more piranhas we've probably eaten 13 14 fish each and i just feel alive again my brain started working my stomach started grumbling body starting to operate again wow that feels good during this period, I just couldn't stop thinking about food. So far on this trip, we've eaten armadillo, spider monkey, kinkajou, tortoise. But this will be the first time ever that we've eaten any type of cat. Um, it was um, it was extraordinary. I'd go to bed into my hammock, um, and you know. <laughs> I was thinking about Mr. Kipling's French fancies for some reason and um, the pink ones would just go round and round and round my head and then in the morning you know when you you can hear the sounds of the birds and then the light comes up and then the day started and you think I know that I haven't slept a single wink and I, I would start going mad um, and Cho had this expression which was quando I I quando no I no I um, which if you translate it it's incredibly annoying because it just means <laughs> when there is there is and when there isn't there isn't which is, yeah, is, is, is pretty annoying until he then told me his backstory and um, he'd, as an 11 year old, um, the Shining Path had attacked his village and he'd had to escape into the hills and live on his own as an 11 year old. And his mum and dad were in the village and he could hear the gunshots and the explosions and stuff going on. And his little expression of when there is, there is, and when there isn't, there isn't was a way of him somehow innately understanding that there was no point in focusing on the things that he hadn't got um he was just wasting energy he just had to just completely accept that and then move forward positively extraordinarily wise but a sort of natural wisdom but i decided this is a bit reckless we need to we need to get some money in so i've got a macbook an old white one and um we had the fastest internet in the um amazon actually i'd point my satellite internet link up through a hole in the canopy find a fallen tree then have a corresponding hole in the canopy point this thing up and i knew michael jackson was dead within about two minutes of it being announced on the internet and i was right in the middle of of, of the amazon jungle um and I thought, right, okay, we've got a very small following and I'm not being um, humble here. We had about 450 people follow the expedition, but I put out a little plea. I cut together on my laptop some of the footage that I've been recording and put it to a Coldplay soundtrack and, and put a PayPal symbol uh, button next to it and said, look, if you've been liking the expedition, please donate. And, and the response was utterly humbling. Within the next few months, we had £40,000 come into the expedition to reinsure us, to buy new um, satellite technology equipment, to buy Cho's flights home to, to pay for the rest of the expedition. We were really, really lucky on this um, trip for so many, so many reasons. Um, we didn't get any malaria, typhoid, dengue, none of the big tropical diseases. I did get um, a bot fly in my head. I don't know whether anyone um, has uh, had bot flies in the head. Not serious at all, not remotely dangerous. But to the end of the expedition, we were just caning it down roads, um, doing huge, huge days in about um, 21 hours before we were due to arrive on the beach. And I'd got my flights booked for the next day and supposedly there was press that were organized to come to the beach on the last day um i just i started getting really faint and then i came out in a nettle sting rash like all over my body bumps all over my body um and then i passed out in the road and um cho um cho said to me uh, when i when i woke up he's like oh, okay i reckon we need to have a couple of hours sleep and i was like I reckon you're probably right, Joe. And so we had a couple of hours sleep. And then with about 18 hours left to go, we had about 85 kilometers still to walk. So we walked all the way through the day, all the way through the evening, all the way through the night. And then as the sun came up and we hadn't had any sleep this night at all, um, this, these media crews started descending on us, sort of Reuters and Associated Press and CNN and stuff. And we were just like, this is extraordinary. Not only have we done two and a half years of walking and, and it looks like we're going we're gonna to reach the end today, but also we might even be recognized um for doing it as well and then you know when you're by the sea and you can hear the uh, sort of s the gulls and the waves starting to crash and you could smell the salt in the air and then we rounded this corner and we could just see the atlantic ocean stretched out in front of us and uh, cho and i instinctively shrugged off our rucksacks and just grinned at each other and started legging it down the beach and also i'm not really sure why we um we started holding hands as we ran down the beach which i thought was um 
somewhat typical the uh, the one day that the world's meeting is media is looking at you and you're holding hands skipping down the beach um it was undeniably the best day of my life um uh, but i wouldn't want to take all the credit for this expedition um cho he always knew that he wasn't going to be able to say that he'd walked the length of the Amazon. He joined in month five, but he definitely did all of the hard stuff. And I have no idea whether I would have been able to complete it without him. He, At that point, he had never seen the sea before. He had never tasted salt water. Um, he came from a, a landlocked part of uh, Peru. And, um, you know, I had to explain to him that you couldn't drink salt water. And that was how extraordinary it was. I experienced him going on his first er elevator. I experienced him going on his first plane. Um, but he gave up two years of his life to help me get through this. And he did it because... He just wanted to embrace life, but also because he wanted to help me, which was amazing. Two and a half years of walking through the Amazon, and this is the Atlantic Ocean. I didn't think I didn't think I was going to be this happy. <laughs> I've been grumbling and moaning all the way down the road. It's just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. That is my above and beyond story. I hope you enjoyed it. I've been Ed Stafford and uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, post your uh, questions in the comments below and um, I'll be doing a live Q&A with another one of the Land Rover Ambassadors in a few days and I will try and answer them then. From me, goodbye. <laughs>